What's happening, everybody? Peter Martin here. Welcome to Wednesday evening duo live from our living room, live from our studio, live coming to you, coming together for the music. And uh, I'm so excited about my special guest uh, this evening and uh, really looking forward to hearing him, catching up and introducing him, Mr. Sullivan Fortner. Uh, I'm going to play a tune to kind of warm things up and uh, I think some stories through the music and through our words will unfold uh, this evening. And uh, we, we both first met quite a few years ago. You're going to be amazed because this guy is so good and so young. And when I tell you that we met like, you know, 17 or 18 years ago, you're not going to be able to understand it. But that's all going to come out. Uh, but it all kind of started in New Orleans. So um, I'd like to start out the evening, kind of set the tone with a composition that's a little bit of an anthem for uh, several generations of modern jazz players, music players in New Orleans, written by our dearly departed Mr. Ellis Marsalis, uh, one of our musical fathers, one of our most important musical fathers in New Orleans. Um, and uh, this is Swinging at the Haven. So thank you guys for being here. Settle back, relax, and coming at you.
Swinging at the Haven by Ellis Marsalis. Welcome to Wednesday night if you're just joining in. Right now I'd like to introduce a gentleman who I've had the pleasure of, of hearing quite a bit over the years uh, develop uh, into one of the most amazing jazz pianists on the scene today. He's much heralded uh, around the world for his incredible solo piano playing, his work with Roy Hargrove over the years. Uh, his beautiful duos with Cecile Solvant, uh, and much more. Um, without further ado, Mr. Sullivan Fortner. What's up, Sullivan? Hey, Pete. You know, I'm hanging in there, man. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. Coming to us from New York City. Yes, sir, man. Good to see you. Great to hear you, man. That song, man. Woo! That song brings back so many memories. We watched that oh, song up so many times at Noka, man. <laughs> oh, I know it. I know oh, it. To, ooh, we used to botch that song up too bad. <laughs> no, 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 but, no, well, maybe a little bit, but you nailed it too. So, you know. Uh, no, man. I always tell people yeah. if I played anything good, it was because of the teachers that I had. Oh. If I played anything bad, it was because I did something wrong that they told me not to do. So, well, you know, yeah. I mean, we all start where we start, but you started. I was. It was such a pleasure to have a little bit of a window into seeing your your start as, as a musician and as a pianist and, and to know you since you were a, a young guy. Um, but I've always been a fan and, uh, you know, seeing you, I guess, I guess the last time I saw you in person was the Jazz Cruise. Was that this year? It feels like three years ago, but I think that was this year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was January, February. January or February maybe even? It seems like yeah. a lifetime ago, man. Wow. I know. Well, seeing as today is February 279th or March 279th, actually. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> man. Yeah. Great to so, hear. um, yeah, man, I'm I'm looking forward to just catching up and and um, finding out what's going on. But I'd love to just give you the stage here and let you do your thing, uh, like 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 I know you can, and I'm looking forward to it. Oh boy. Um, what could I play? Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, um, let's keep it in New Orleans a little bit. Um, that works. This is, uh, I'm going to attempt a James Booker composition. Oh, uh, come on. Lord I'm happy Christ. already. Lord <laughs> Jesus. Uh, go easy on me. This is uh, Put Out the Light. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. 
come on, man. You couldn't see me, but I was like, uh, what? Man, <laughs> grooving. <laughs> grooving on the internet. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, man, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Man, so, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you jumped, jumped up on some James Booker because I think a lot of, I mean, you know, this, we, I think we get a pretty hip crowd here. But, you know, a lot of folks know Professor Longhair, Dr. John, so many great pianists from New Orleans. But, I mean, James Booker, it doesn't, for solo New Orleans p piano, it, it, it doesn't get any higher than that. It really doesn't. It's just, it's just pure. And it's like, it's funny because you can hear a bunch of different versions of that tune. And each of them is just so different. It's like a, he knew how to, trick you. just when you think you figured him out, he does something else to just completely just destroy everything that you ever thought that he was. He was such a, a mysterious um, genius. Yes, I know. And I mean, you know, the way the, 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 all the New Orleans cast, when I first got down there, would talk about Booker. It was like, I mean, they talk about all the musicians, but you know, it's New Orleans. There's so many great piano players. It takes a lot to impress other musicians, but you know, the drummers, yeah. when they talk about Booker and stuff, it's like, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, well, you know what? Maybe I'll do... Uh, I was going to do something else. You, I mean, the New Orleans thing, I don't even want to leave that. I wrote a tune um, a few years ago called Broadmoor for my old neighborhood in New Orleans. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, so maybe I'll pull, th pull that out. And I mean, it's no James Booker, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's what it is. So <laughs> this is Broadmoor. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. Yeah. So Sullivan Fortner, everybody, by the way. Sullivan Fortner.
sound like sound like the corner of Broad and Napoleon to me. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, we, it was written about two blocks from there, so. Oh man, kill. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, man. So. Killer. Oh, thanks, Sullivan. Thanks, Sullivan. So, uh, Sullivan, you graduated from a number of prestigious institutions, but I got to say, NOCA, uh, which you mentioned earlier and called out its name, the New Orleans Center for the uh, Creative Arts, uh, you were there at a special time. Actually, the whole time it's been open has been a special time because it's probably uh, has the richest tradition of producing amazing, not only musicians, but artists, uh, actors, playwrights. I mean, it's like people talk about there's something in the, in the water in New Orleans. There is. That's why we got to boil the water sometimes. That's right. But, <laughs> but that, can, can you just talk a little bit about your time there and some of the other you know, great musicians that you came up with uh, during, oh, during that, that great time? I remember auditioning New Orleans Central Creative Arts and um, Clyde Kerr Jr., the, the infamous Clyde Kerr, did my yeah. audition. And he asked me to play a C major scale, and I played it. I had just learned how to play a C major scale of two octaves. All right, he was like, okay, cool, uh, E flat. And I was like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, you play G? No, I can't play it. Yeah, I, can't. I don't know any other scales other than C major, you know. And so he was like, okay, well then play, play, a, play a jazz tune, play a blues. I was like, I don't know. I never heard of blues. <laughs> and he said, okay, um, well, play a hymn. I was like, oh, that's easy. So I auditioned, <laughs> auditioned uh, Noka on a hymn. And he was like, all right, I'm going to accept you, but you need to get a piano teacher. As a matter of fact, I need you to come a few months early that, and, and, and to a summer program that they put on here, and that will prep you for the next school year. And I did the summer program, and um, that's where I met the illustrious Peter Martin. He taught me how to play E flat scale up and helped me play F major scale. All the stuff that I couldn't play, he taught me how to play. And he said, you have to get it. You have to get this, man. This is important. And I was like, OK. <laughs> um, so the following year, I, I, I get into school, he was like, yeah, uh, so we're moving you up a level because you did the summer program, so you coming in as a level two. So my class as a level two was Christian Scott, Troy mm -hmm. Trombone, Shorty Andrews. Those were the first people that I met and played with, and I played the slow yeah. blues with those people. And um, have been friends with them ever since. And um, yeah. among others, John Baptiste came in a year later, and we, we practiced together. We had like a bunch of um, Oscar Peterson contests. Who could play the most like Oscar Peterson would be crowned <laughs> Oscar Peterson of the day. You know, we had like, we had a good time. And I met a lot of friends in the classical department. And, you know, yep. met Dean Curtis, who, you know, mm. got me, got me uh, interested in Bach and Chopin and people like that. And, yeah, Noka was... Look, it was a beautiful place. Looking back on it, I really, you know, I miss those times, you know. I just miss mm. that kind of camaraderie and fellowship that we had with each other back then. It was a lot of fun. It was like the brothers I never had, you know. Absolutely. And I, I remember, you know, just peeking in on, you know, you and Chris Scott and, and, and Troy. And you guys would be in the practice rooms just killing it. And... uh and, you know, that camaraderie, I was like, yeah, this, this is how it's supposed to be. But it's funny because I remember that, that, that summer program a little bit differently. I don't remember anything about the scales. What I remember is kind of saying, like, I was like, what, what, what records, what CDs have you listened to? And you were like, um, you know, I think you might have named a couple of gospel kind of things, but, you know, and maybe some pop stuff. But I was like, you know, like jazz stuff, McCoy Tyner, Oscar Peterson. You were like, no, not really. And I happened to have... I think it was either Empire and Isles or, or Maiden Voyage uh, CD with me, or maybe I brought it the next day or something, and I gave it to you, which was actually, thinking back on it, uh, was like the totally wrong first CD. But had I known, well, I mean, it's like, here, go learn this. Like, I was the laziest teacher ever. I'm like, check out this advanced Herbie Hancock stuff, you know. But you did it. Like, you took it home and, and learned it. Like, every day, you come back, like, with another tune. Like, you were playing the voicings and stuff. And I was like, wow, well, this, I said, this is going to be an easy summer program. <laughs> yeah, he was like, all right, cool. Do the next track. Give me another track for next week. Okay, that was right. totally, that was totally it. And then, because um, 
because I think in the fall I kind of went back out on the road and didn't see you for a minute, but I would always talk with Mr. Kerr, with Clyde Kerr, and I'd stop back in and see you guys, and, you know, your progress was just uh, – Torren torrential. I mean, it was it was really incredible, especially that first year. I remember, and then I was like, and I think we talked about lessons or something. But we never. I was always like, you know, get the classical teacher. I was like, that's going to give you the other stuff. But I'm like, you're listening to the right stuff. You're playing with your peers. You really had the infrastructure there, and I could see that that spark in your eye. You know, I was like, you you had all the elements, and so you know, I'm so proud of you. You know, you went on to Oberlin after that, and um, and and then Manhattan School of Music. You're you're well degreed and everything. And um, so it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, I got a degree. I got a couple of degrees that shows you that I can learn. <laughs> so I could learn. I got a couple of degrees that said I can learn. I learned how to learn at these schools. You know? Well, you know, I was thinking, too, that, you know, one thing that from your generation, um, from when we were coming up that really changed was, like, you know, you guys um, – you know, uh, Christian Sands and you, I did a thing with Emmett a couple weeks ago. All you guys, you know, did great with your school. We were all like dropouts, man, all of us, me and M M McBride. I, I, I think I lasted one more semester at Juilliard than McBride did. And he was like, wow. oh, come on, man, I'm, I'm coming up, you know. Uh, Har Hargrove, you know, Hargrove didn't last long at Berkeley. Oh, and God, Greg no. Hutchinson, everybody. Um, but I think you guys have done a, done a great job of both getting out there and playing, but also taking advantage of the educational things. Oh, okay. um, yeah. no, I want to talk to you about Roy Hargrove too in, in a minute, but if, if it's cool, maybe we'll. Um, whose turn? Oh, it's your turn, which is great. Yeah, I'm going to sit back and listen, but I want to just talk to you about Roy because I think, uh, you know, your, your time with him, I mean, all of us, they got a chance to, to play with him in that band. I'm, I, it was pivotal, so I always like to reflect on that. Oh, Lord. Well, now? Well, you want to play first and then we'll talk some more? Why don't we do that? Okay. Uh, is that cool? What can I play? That would since we leading into a Roy section. Um, let's do. Um, oh man, what can I do? What would be a good one? Would it be weird to do a ballad now? No, no, it feels like ballad time. Okay. It's um, pandemic. It's it's pandemic. It's Wednesday night. It's always ballad time. <laughs> All right. Um, Roy, they're, 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 I'm in between two now. So you tell me which two. Never let me go, or um, you're my everything. Ooh, that's. I mean, I love never. I love them both, but never let me go. I actually learned that from because of Roy. So yeah, me too. That's that's okay. special. <laughs> it, uh, it is, yeah. Every night, every set, man. Every night, every set. So this is never let me go. All right.
So beautiful, so beautiful. Never let me go. Let yeah, me Sullivan. Go. That was fantastic, fantastic. Almost like a deconstructed "Never Let Me Go." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just put them together. Yeah. Oh man, it's so so much great stuff happening in there. Um, I just want to say, not to make you nervous and make me nervous, I took a quick look at the chat while you were playing and. The wonderful, beautiful, illustrious, talented Diane Reeves is actually watching tonight oh, and gosh. requested when we were talking about the two. I know exactly. Well, if I'm going to be nervous, you got to be nervous, too. But we want to <laughs> give a big shout out to Diane. And she Hi, actually Diane, finished. I love you. <laughs> Diane Reeves, um, I remember when she first heard you, she came and, and said, oh, you got to hear. I think it was at one of the piano competitions or something. And she's like, you got to hear this um, pianist from New Orleans, this this, this guy is the real deal. And I'm like, oh, pianist from New Orleans. I'm like, I know all the pianists from New Orleans. I was like, is his name Sullivan? And she's like, yeah, how'd you know? I was like, oh, I've been knowing Sullivan for a while. But um, she's a huge fan of yours, has been for a while. And she mentioned oh. September in the Rain, too. Oh, uh, man, which Roy, yeah, that's, that, that's a, I mean, so many great standards with Roy. You know, his tunes and, I mean, his, you know, the breadth of what he did was, was so amazing. And, um I think too, you know, when, when I played with Roy, I was, I was young like you were when you played with Roy and, and he had a huge influence on me. But 
I, I wonder if, how, if, how different it was. Maybe it wasn't, but we were like the same age. I mean, he was, he was like a year older than me. And so I knew him from when we were in high school. Uh, yeah. But it was still such a, there was a camaraderie playing with him. Um, you know, and everybody, we were all, you know, young lions or whatever the hell they were calling us. Now we're like gristled, old, aging, uh, aging lions. But uh, it was such a fun time then. But what was it like when you played with him? Because that was, I mean, you had already done some stuff, but that band, when you were in the band, you know, with Montez and, and, and Roy and Justin, and that was like really one of, if not the, the greatest of Roy's band. How, what was the experience like for you? Um, it was definitely... Um it was definitely a shock. It was a culture shock, you know. I'm used to being in school, you know, with a bunch of people my age, you know. So to be the youngest person on the bandstand with a group of men who already had a sound before I got there, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And trying to figure out where their sound was, where their sound was coming from, and where I fit in all of that um, mm -hmm. was definitely a learning experience for me. Um, and I joined, uh, I joined at a real special time, I would like to think it's a special time, because it was towards the beginning of Roy's decline, as far as his health and, um, like, the, you know, his, um, his endurance to play got, got weaker when I, when I started, like, mm. when I had my, was in the middle of my residency, you know, and right. to witness him, you know, with chops failing and, you know, range, and, you know, losing his teeth and all kinds of stuff in the bandstand and, you know, and seeing him play through it, you know, watching him just be like, you know, just like no matter what, if I'm, I'm, I could be like laying on the floor, like feeling like crap and I'm going to get on the bandstand. I'm going to give everything that I have. Mm. And that was a, that, those were wake up call moments for me, you know, because then I realized it was like, okay, I can't be in this because of the girls. I can't be in it because of the money. I can't <laughs> be in it because, you know, of a downbeat critics poll or whatever. I have to be in it because I love it, you know what I mean? And I have to mm. be willing to give my life and lay it down every day um, for the music, for the bandstand and that. And for the people that I'm playing with, you know, mm. it was a really, it was a really spiritual moment just to be in that band and, and to watch him just give everything he had, you know, even right. through all of the criticism, through all of the, you know, everybody saying, well, Roy don't sound as good as he used to. He's washed up and he's done and all that stuff. And he's just playing right through it. It's almost like he didn't hear them when they were praising him. He didn't hear them when they were criticizing him. He just, <laughs> focused on the music 100 percent yeah i mean I, I i i feel like roy was and continues to be you know the conscious of the, our music you yeah, know man. i mean I, I think i don't think a day goes by that i don't think about him at some point or or something that he played or something and you know roy it was not about what he was saying it was about what he would do or what he would play That's right. um and but i think that that spirit that you're talking about um where you're living for the music, it almost harkens back to another age, uh, or at least what we imagine, you know, Dizzy Gillespie and Duke Allington and Charlie Parker and Miles and, uh, you know, all these legends that were before us, but where it was all about the music and, yeah. and the adversity was, was real and uh, what, they, what they laid out, you know, for us. But I think Roy, it was like he was from another time. Like he just, I mean, you know how he'd be like, tired and we'd all be tired and play the gig and and his health stuff had been going on even since you know we were coming up in the mm -hmm. 90s but then it would be like a jam session a, a 20 minute cab ride come on man let's go over there you know in, in, in warsaw or something like what you know yeah. he was there man i mean he wanted to play he lived to play yeah. and and at a high level too it was not like you know i mean at a very high level and and you know that tune i, I love that you played that never let me go because i remember him teaching me that tune at the piano and like the precision of his you know how you'd have the voicings it was kind of basic but it was actually pretty advanced like his voice leading and his ability to move stuff around I mean it wasn't like what you did but it was the foundation like he really knew these tunes oh, yeah, and he when did. he was playing you could hear that but when he'd go to the piano it was like oh you know and he knew all the little nuances and stuff I really he really loved Sarah Vaughan and he really mm. loved um I remember right, 
he really loved people like Carmen McCray and Shirley Horn. So yep. much so that whenever he played the flugelhorn, that's who he was trying to emulate. You yep. know, he was he was just he really he even told me it's like, man, everybody loves your ballad playing. Like, what is it that you're doing, or what is it that you're thinking about? He's like, man, I'm just trying to play like Sarah Vaughan's song. That's it. <laughs> so easy. It's so like, easy. It's so yeah. easy. It's like you're yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did some gigs. Actually, we did a little mini tour with Carmen McRae with that band with Roy. Rodney yeah. Whitaker, Greg Hutchinson, Ron Blake, and, and with it was just a couple gigs with Carmen, and, and like he he didn't wilt at all standing next. I mean, and you know, Carmen was a presence, you know, oh, yeah. uh, vocally and pianistically. Oh my and, God. But I mean, like he could really get in there and, 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 and match that, you know, that sound melodically. But yeah, I know he, lo- he loves Sarah Vaughan. I mean, he uh, live in Mr. Kelly's. That was his jam. Oh, that I mean, was a bunch his of jam, records. Man. That but was that was his jam. jam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? Maybe I'll play. I was thinking there's there's a couple tunes of Roy's. Did you ever did you ever play or come across this tune, Spiritual Companion? Was he still doing that? I'm not Just sure. One of his Roy, real... Roy changed the names of the songs so many times, and a lot of times I never knew any of the, the titles of any of the songs we played. He'd just start playing, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, that one. So I never right, knew right. any of his titles. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how I learned this because I'd heard it because it's on like one of his first records. I think it's on that one with like Jeff Keezer and maybe um, man, like one of those like Public Eye, one of those really early records, um, and um, where he was just young and green, but already doing his thing. But I've always loved this tune, um, and it was the same thing. Like he just like one of the first gigs, he just sort of started playing it, and I was sort of I had heard it, so I could kind of play some of it. But afterwards, I remember he sat down, showed it to me, and like wrote it out. And uh, so maybe I'll play that next. We'll stay on a little on a little Roy vibe for a minute. Spiritual Ooh. companion.
spiritual yeah. Spiritual companion. Yeah, it was Yeah, spiritual companion. It was super early. We did it for for he kind of brought it back for a quick minute and then I think I mean, you know, he had so many tunes and then started going in so many different directions, oh, but yeah. I love the early stuff. I love the later stuff too. I love, you know, Roy always there, he was always had that tinge of like there was always a little bit of smooth jazz in a good way <laughs> in his stuff. You know what I mean? Like his core, like his voicings, the flugelhorn. There was he was never like he was always like a half step away from some straight up smooth. Jazz. That's a Texas. He was almost that's a, there. That's a, yeah. Yeah. He was exactly. There. Yeah. But then he's so steeped in the tradition, you know. Oh it's God. Like, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. So uh, what's been going on during this, uh, you know, the obligatory question of what's happening with you during the pandemic? Uh, what, what is life looking like? You're in New York City. You've got that beautiful Steinway there. I, I can tell you've been practicing. That's not a problem. But um, well, how, do, how do you kind of see this period in terms of your development and how are you using this and how do you see us getting out of this in terms of music and jazz and piano? Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know how it's going to look for the future, but I, I do think that, um, I mean, for me, it's been um, just about self-enrichment, you know, I've been doing things, for a long time I've just been kind of like just in the mindset of music and, you know, just trying to be a better musician, that I haven't really taken the time to just be an a overall better person. <laughs> yeah. So I've been, you know, just reading a little bit more, and um, I've been uh, doing a little bit of cooking, which is mm. interesting for me. And uh, nice. I'm having a really good time doing it, you know. People yeah. are actually telling me, I, I you know, gave my food to a few people just to see, you know, and say if they didn't like it, it was from a restaurant or whatever, but if it was, if they <laughs> liked it, it was mine. And, uh, right. People have, it, it's, it, it's been really rewarding to actually make something and people actually like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been doing that. and um, But yeah, other than that, there's been like, I'm thinking about maybe taking some um, online courses, some visual art online courses that they have, like mm. through the MoMA, you know, just things like that. Just trying to expand. Because I'm really realizing that all of these different art disciplines are connected, you know what I mean? You know, the sure. literature is connected, yeah. you know. A lot of people forget, like, if you talk about an era in the music, we'll say that era was a time. So if it was a time, then it means that there's books that goes with it. That means that there's uh, visual arts that go with it, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's about culture, it's about just exploring culture a little bit more, for me. Yeah, um, that's great. But, uh, so I, is, I, um, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm just like I'm. I'm gearing up. Um, actually, next week to go back into the studio and just record a solo thing. Just, just hit the record button and just see what happens. You know, I've been writing oh, a little that's... bit, and uh, we'll see what happens. That that makes my heart uh, warm because I. Uh, I mean, I love all the projects that you've done, and I'm so proud of you. But I think that your solo piano playing is so exciting and and deep and you've got so many different places to go so i will eagerly be awaiting that and i'm glad to have a little bit of a preview of it tonight as well um and i was wondering if there was okay you and cecile um you and cecile solvant at the beginning of the pandemic i want to say it was like the second week you guys did a live stream duo show that was really extraordinary. I remember tuning in. I think it was the first live stream that I tuned in uh, during that weird period. I mean, not yeah. that we're not that we're in a non weird period now, but it was really weird then. And it was so intimate. It, it, it was, I think, at her place on the upright piano, one camera angle. But you guys just it was such a special thing. And I, I think to a lot of people that was an inspiring night. I know for me, it kind of was made me realize like, wow, OK, music the world's going to kind of pause or stop or end or who the heck knows what's going to happen. But music is very much alive. And you guys really captured kind of a moment and a night because I talked to a number of people that had similar feelings. And that was kind of a legendary evening. It was a long show and you guys took requests, I think. And it was like you guys were up in the chat and it was such a it was such a special thing. Um, have you guys had any thoughts of 
of doing that again, or what, what, what are your feelings about that? Um, she did, she started not too long after a Patreon page, mm -hmm. um, and, and tried to, did a stab at it, did like something for her mom's French school, it's like a short 20 minute concert of all French music, and, um, she, you know, and then she did a few other things kind of like throughout and a couple Q and A's and like on Instagram, but it hasn't been like yeah. a full fledged concert again, you know, since then, you know, I mean, well, I, I know folks, to, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I'm just saying folks would, by folks, I mean me and all the other folks would love, if you guys ever want to come do it on Open Studio here, we'll provide the platform or whatever, that would be great, or wherever, because it was, I mean, not that you need to try to duplicate that evening, that was, that was its own thing, but I know you guys have a number of evenings uh, like that in you, if, if, if the spirit moves you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, yeah. It was kind of like one of those, just the weird ideas that she had. She was just like, let's just do a little, like a little 30 minute thing. I learned like the first four songs, she gave me like maybe a day or two to learn, you know? So I was uh -huh. like, all right, let me listen. We, we actually watched Yento and she was like, I want to do this song from Yento. And I was like, <laughs> okay, so we'll just go ahead and do it on the stream concert. She's like, yeah, let's just do Yento on the concert and we'll just see what happens. And you know, that 30 minute actually ended up being like a, Two hour, almost a two hour concert slash Q and A thing. People started bringing requests and all this stuff. It, it, it actually turned out to be a lot of fun for the both of us because we didn't really think anybody was going to watch it. <laughs> right. You know. Right. There was a bunch of people I remember, and and li like I say, it's it's kind of gone down as one of those legendary things. So thank you all for that. And another thing I just want to mention, if you want to hear um, Cecile and Sullivan, of course the record, The Window, that's like one of my favorite records period that's come out over the last 10 to 20 years and it's just an amazing duo record that they did i highly recommend that but also the tiny desk concert you guys did uh which you did some of that music as i recall but that's like a really i mean i love tiny desk concerts but i don't love all of them because you know everyone's like tiny desk is so great i'm like well come on who who's who's on the tiny desk you know <laughs> but uh but you were playing that upright, man. They had it, you had it sounding great, and they had it mic'd great. Like, and it was captured in a way that belied that, that little upright and it really just sh showcased your skills, you know, your touch and your pianistic skills. But that was, that's a really special thing. And I think that's still available, right, on the NPR site? I'm sure it's it still, is. It's probably on YouTube, yeah. too. Yeah. Right. So I, I recommend that if you want to get some more Sullivan and Cecile. So mm -hmm. um, what you got next? We've got a couple uh, more minutes. A couple more. Let's see. Um, let's do. Um, I think about doing something three. This is. Uh, kind of been thinking a little bit about this too, and this is a Kenny Wheeler tune. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Uh, everybody's song but my own. I'm gonna give it a try. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's Kenny Wheeler? What's, what, what's the name of that tune? Uh, it's called Everybody's Song But My Own. Everybody. Oh, man. Incredible. Mm -hmm. He killed it. Great stuff. Great stuff. So uh, we're going to do something. We don't know what we're going to do. Everything's been improvised, which is that's how we do it. That's how we always yeah. do it. But we want to thank everybody for being here this evening and um, let you know that you can pick up a virtual ticket. I don't even know if you knew about this, Sullivan. Do you know about virtual? Everything's virtual. Virtual school, virtual concerts, everything. But we have virtual tickets, and if you do that, all the proceeds go to the artists, go to the artists, which is Sullivan Forder, actually, as well as um, our nonprofit of the week. Every week we have a different nonprofit. This week we're partnering with We Are All Music Foundation, uh, WAM, which is doing some great things, providing meaningful support to the most impactful nonprofit organizations that use the power of music to improve lives and benefit society. And basically, they partner with organizations, especially in the New York area, but all around the country, um, to, to bring in proceeds and help out the best, most impactful nonprofits. So if folks want to go to openstudio.live, you can pick up your virtual ticket. And we've got everything from VIP level down to what we call the I'm broke but I love the music ticket. Yeah. That's, that's, that's your entry point, you know? It's all good, man. Times are tough out here. So right. if you're broke but you love the music, go ahead and pick up one of those, openstudio.live. And um, I don't know, I was thinking we were talking about, and I threw this at you literally 60 seconds before we started and went on air, Sullivan. So it's all good either way, but we could do some trading. We've been, have you done that at all with anybody at a distance via the internet at all? I did a trading thing, I think, maybe with Aaron Parks. I think I did one. I did one. I did a. Um, I did something for the Akron Jazz Festival. And mm. uh, it was me, Ben Patterson, mm. Glenn Zaleski, and. Uh, oh, man, Justin Coughlin. We oh, okay. Did like a, we did like a little. We traded like eight bars on Stella by Starlight or something. That was. Something. Okay. Cool. Well, we just want to, yeah, so if you're up for it, maybe we'll try something and right. uh, s see where it goes. But, um, you know, like we let folks know, you know, when you talk o over Zoom or you talk on, on live or whatever, you don't notice the latency. But when you play music with the high level and precision that we do, as we say, this, <laughs> this little bit of latency can be a little crazy. So um, give us a little bit of slack if we happen to be like a quarter of a second off from each other. That's not us. That's that. That's the speed of the internet. So, the um, what? Do, yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you want to do? Oh man, uh, it, let's do September in the rain. Let's do it for Roy. Man. Ooh, cool. Let's do September for Roy. Should we do Roy's key? See if I remember Roy's yeah, key. Yeah, sure. E flat. E flat. Was, e flat. Of course, it got to be yeah. E flat. Okay. You got it. Cool. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. 
All of it. Oh, that felt great. Yeah, man. man. All right. As soon as as soon as we get out of this, we're doing duo concert. Bosendorfer, Steinway, whatever. We're doing it, man. Yay. I'll, I'll be I'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun. Lot Absolutely. Of fun. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sullivan Fortner, and uh, such a pleasure, Sullivan. Thank you for being here. Thank you everybody for for joining us on this Wednesday evening. We hope that you are staying safe. Uh, we're staying socially distant, and Sullivan and I are, are staying so socially distant. We're just s separated by a screen, but I feel spiritually connected with you as always, Sullivan, and everybody out there through the music. So thanks a lot, Sullivan, and let's do this again. Yeah, man, I'd be honored, man. Thank you so much for having me, man. All right, thank you. If you guys, if you feel it upon your heart, go to openstudio.live, pick up a virtual ticket, and until next time, peace, good night. Good night.